Today I'm going to talk to Mr Guy Wimps Holding. He's a consultant neurologist and neurology cancer lead for East Lancashire. We're going to focus on prostate cancer. My first question is, what's the sensitivity, specificity and positive predictive value of the prostate specific antigen test? Okay, well, of course you wouldn't ask me that question if it was a nice, simple, easy answer. Wouldn't it be great if we had a black and white, yes and no, uh, test which we could apply to men to see whether or not they had prostate cancer. Yes, and they have prostate cancer definitely and nothing else. No, they don't have prostate cancer. But of course, we haven't got that. What we have is prostate-specific antigen, which at the moment is the best generally used test. But we know that, that it's not a cancer-specific test, so it's, a, it's an organ-specific test. It, it relates to the health of the prostate, rather than specifically whether or not there's cancer there. So we know with PSA testing there's always going to be a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives. So inevitably the sensitivity and specificity results aren't that good actually. And to my mind I'm not even sure they're that useful in clinical practice. So we have some results here we can look at um, which are taken from a trial uh, looking at a potential prophylaxis against prostate cancer. Um, using 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So all men going into that trial had to be proven as far as possible not to have prostate cancer. So they all had a PSA check done. They all had biopsies regardless of the, the level of PSA. And so we have results for prostate cancer findings uh, right down to the very lowest levels of PSA. And of course if you're talking sensitivity and specificity then the level at which you set your threshold for normal and, and an abnormal result will affect the sensitivity and specificity results. So from this particular trial, uh, if you take a level of just 1.1, then the sensitivity is quite high at 83%. The specificity is low at 39%. So a lot of false positives, in other words. Um, having said that, that sensitivity of 83% is for all prostate cancers. If you look at just the aggressive cancers that that will find, then the sensitivity is higher at 93%. The, the usual threshold that we've used is in fact higher than that, so about 4, 4.1 in this particular study. Uh, and at that le level, the sensitivity is much less, so 20% for all cancers, 40% for aggressive cancers. So a specificity of 94%, a sensitivity of 20% for all prostate cancer, 40% for aggressive cancers. So those are the kind of figures that, that um, PSA will give. If you think about Wilson and Jungner's criteria for screening tests, PSA fails really quite badly. And, uh, and we know that it's not a great test in terms of diagnosing prostate cancer. It's useful for monitoring prostate cancer once it's diagnosed, but not good for diagnosing it. In clinical practice, to my mind, the positive predictive value is a more useful test. In other words, what does someone with a certain level of PSA, what is their risk of having prostate cancer? So same trial. These figures come from there, uh, and they, they I think, demonstrate uh, both the advantages and disadvantages of PSA testing. So if we look at a, a very low level uh, of naught to 1, so really at the bottom end of the, the, uh, the scale for prostate cancer, then even at that level, 11.1% of, of the patients had prostate cancer. Uh, only 1% had high-grade prostate cancer. If we take the normal level uh, threshold level of 4 uh, and a range of 4 to 6, then 48% actually had prostate cancer. Uh, so perhaps in clinical uh, practice that's a slightly more useful thing, that uh, if you've got a PSA of a certain level we can look at the tables and see what your risk of having prostate cancer is. PSA alone is, is the most useful indicator of whether or not someone has prostate cancer and the risk certainly goes up as the, the level goes up. But of course we can combine it with other clinical features and perhaps refine the results of, of, uh, of, of the risk prediction for a particular patient. Uh, so again, some, some figures taken from uh, American cancer databases. Uh, and on this particular graph you can see that uh, we have PSA along the bottom, patient's risk of having prostate cancer uh, along the side. Uh, and then added in are some clinical features, so looking at the PSA and whether or not the rectal examination was suspicious of cancer, whether or not there was a positive or negative family history. 
Um, so, for instance, if we look at a, a typical clinical value of a patient who comes up with a PSA of 6, if we read off here, then we can see that uh, if the prostate feels benign and there's no family history of prostate cancer, then there's about a 40% risk, 40% chance of that patient having a prostate cancer. Now, this doesn't break it down into uh, all prostate cancers and aggressive cancers, but overall, about a 40% risk. If we go to the other end of the scale here, someone who has a, a malignant feeling prostate and a positive family history, then their risk of prostate cancer goes up to about 70%. So we can refine what we're saying to patients uh, on the basis of their PSA result by including these other clinical features. Just as a, perhaps a rough guide in terms of the higher levels of PSA reading, uh, if we're talking about levels of up to 20, then almost always that would indicate, if there is cancer present, that this is a localised problem, so it's in the region of the prostate. For readings of over 50, then at that stage, at that level and above, we're pretty certain that there's going to be metastatic disease, even if it's micrometastatic disease. Uh, in the grey area between 20 to 50, then we're usually talking of fairly locally advanced and possibly micrometastatic disease. Um, so that gives an idea of the, the risk of, uh, of uh, disease at the higher levels. How should we communicate prostate cancer risk to men? Yeah, well, that, that too, I think, is a difficult one to, to encapsulate. I mean, it does often start with the question of whether or not the patient should have a PSA blood test. That, if you like, opens the cans of, can of worms, which uh, leads on to biopsies or, or whatever. Um, so that, that's the point at which the whole process starts. And, of course, there is a lot of information available to patients to help them try and decide whether or not they should have a prostate blood test. This particular one I've taken from uh, the NHS Prostate Cancer Screening website. Um, a double side of A4 information sheet for patients. Really quite confusing, I think, if you read through it, but uh, encapsulated, I think, on the, the second side is this little table, which gives briefly the benefits and the limitations of PSA testing, which I think are quite nicely uh, shown on the table there. If it comes on then to talking about prostate cancer itself, then again, I think it's, it's a difficult concept to get over to a lot of patients because, as we know with prostate cancer, it varies from a lot of other cancers. Um, in other cancers, once you have a, a malignancy there, unless something is done about it, it will grow and spread and could be a life-threatening thing. But we know with prostate cancer, it's almost a normal part of ageing for elderly men to have some malignant cells within the prostate. We also know that the vast majority of those will grow old and die a natural death of something else. The prostate will never have been a problem for them. Um, so that's, that's an, uh, perhaps a difficult concept to get over to patients. Um, however, of course, men do die of prostate cancer. So in the UK, uh, on an annual basis, about 10,000 men every year will die of prostate cancer. So the second commonest cancer killer in men in the UK. In terms of trying to communicate a lifetime risk to a man of being diagnosed or dying of prostate cancer, then in the UK, the lifetime risk of being diagnosed is about one in nine. The lifetime risk of dying of prostate cancer in the UK is about one in 36. So really quite a small chance, but uh, nonetheless there. It's thought that early diagnosis and uh, early treatment of some cancers can improve the chance of survival. But we know from recent screening studies that um, it takes treatment of a lot of patients to save one life. Uh, the results of the European study for prostate cancer screening, uh, the, the initial figures were that it takes 1,400 people to be screened, 48 to be treated to save one life. Um, so really, a lot of overtreatment, perhaps unnecessary overtreatment. Now, in fact, the figures from that trial uh, are changing as the uh, data matures because it is a very long-term illness that we're talking about. And so the number needed to treat to save a life is coming down. Um, but I think still it will be the case that a lot of men will have to be screened. There will be overtreatment in order to save one life from prostate cancer. So not an easy thing to communicate to patients, really, but I hope that gives some, some feeling for the type of risks involved. What treatments are available for prostate cancer and how are choices made? Well, treatment for prostate cancer is very much dependent on 
both the patient themselves, their age, their general health, their life expectancy on the one hand, and then the disease they have on the other hand, um, both its stage and its grade. Um, I guess we could break it down into uh, thinking about localised disease, locally advanced disease, and then subsequently metastatic disease. Um, so with localised disease, there are often quite a choice of treatments, and it's often quite difficult for patients to make their mind up about which particular treatment they want to have. Um, and often the, the most difficult choice comes in a situation where you have someone with a reasonably good life expectancy with um, a good prognosis prostate cancer. In other words, low volume, low grade with a lowish PSA. Um, and there, because of what we know about the fact that there's a lot of clinically uh, unimportant or non-life-threatening disease, um, there is this concept of active surveillance. So withholding any sort of radical treatment until uh, such time as there's any evidence of disease progressing. So on the one hand, you're diagnosing a patient with cancer. The next minute you're saying, well, we're not actually going to do anything active about it, which seems odd to a lot of patients. But nonetheless, I think the results of that sort of approach are very good. And in that kind of situation with good prognosis disease, then, then a surveillance approach withholding radical treatments until such time as there is evidence of disease progression is very definitely a good thing to do. Um, on the other hand, for localised disease, if, if the features of the disease look like this is likely to progress and become a life-threatening thing, then we have a number of different radical treatment options. Um, those commonly available at the moment are surgery, so radical prostatectomy, be that open, laparoscopic or robotic, Radiotherapy, radical radiotherapy, often combined with uh, a short period of hormone manipulation, or brachytherapy, so implantation of radioactive seeds into the prostate. And between those three uh, radical approaches to treatment, the chance of cure is actually very similar between all three. So if patients are choosing in terms of their chance of being cured with the treatment, it's a difficult choice to make. What they are are very different, different types of treatment. So surgery on the one hand, non-surgical intervention on the other with radiotherapy. Uh, and often patients will be able to choose just on the basis of the technical uh, details of the, the particular treatment. Some patients will instinctively want an operation to remove a malignancy. Others will instinctively want to do anything to avoid an operation. And, and often a choice is made on, on those uh, factors. And of course, in medical terms, it doesn't matter particularly which treatment the patient has because, as I have mentioned before, we know that they all have equally a good a chance of cure, generally speaking. I should mention that, uh, as with other areas of prostate cancer, advances are being made all the time, uh, and cryotherapy and uh, high-intensity focused ultrasound, perhaps in a focal application to specific areas of the prostate, are things that are being looked at in the context of trials and may prove in time to be useful treatments, primary treatments for disease. At the moment, though, I think surgery, radiotherapy and brachytherapy uh, are the mainstream treatment options. Uh, if we move on to just talk about locally advanced disease, then we're talking about disease which is, which is perhaps permeated outside the capsule of the prostate or possibly involving some of the local lymph nodes. Um, then uh, in some situations, hormone manipulations with radiotherapy uh, is available. Uh, in, in other situations, perhaps in an elderly or infirm patient with a poor life expectancy, we might decide to, to monitor the situation and only treat perhaps with hormone manipulation if there's definite evidence of advancing disease. How should metastatic prostate cancer be managed? Well, for many years now, the mainstay of treatment of metastatic prostate cancer has been hormone manipulation, and that continues to be the case. Uh, originally, castration or subcapsular orchidectomy was, was the main way of treating that. Uh, more recently, I think a lot of patients are treated with uh, LHRH analog injection treatment, uh, both of which obviously cause castrate levels of testosterone. Uh, and that remains a really effective treatment for metastatic prostate cancer. 80% or so of patients will have a good response to that. However, it's not a cure. It is a palliative measure. It is a holding measure. And on average, it, it will be effective for 18 months or so before the disease relapses. Um, traditionally, then, we would have second-line hormone manipulation, perhaps with an anti-androgen. Uh, and up until recently, uh, once things recurred after that and perhaps a period of withdrawal of the anti-androgen, 
which oddly sometimes also produces a slight response. Um, the next step would be to talk about palliative chemotherapy, um, which has been shown to add uh, a short amount of life. Uh, but really, once we got to that stage, we were beginning to think in terms of uh, the disease reaching its natural conclusion. More recently, there's been a, lo a lot more understanding around the androgen receptor and androgen receptor signaling pathway, and there are new agents being delivered which are uh, effective when the traditional methods of hormone manipulation have stopped being effective. So drugs like abiraterone, MDV3100, uh, are being shown to be effective in a situation where uh, castration or LHRH analogues, then antiandrogens have failed uh, and can, can induce a PSA response thereafter. Exactly when uh, and uh, exactly when those, those drugs are used in the overall scheme of things, whether it's before chemotherapy or after chemotherapy, I think is still being decided. But certainly it's an area where significant advances are being made. So I think uh, hope for the future in terms of the management of metastatic prostate cancer. Of course, ultimately, the disease will uh, be beyond our treatment measures, and then we start talking about palliative treatment, uh, which is similar to other uh, malignancies. <laughs>